holding a space that says, no, these are not shameful topics. No, this is not unnatural. No, this is not bad, wrong, dirty, sinful, period. We all come from sexuality. How on earth could that possibly be wrong? We are made of it. We are in it. It is in everything. It's, it's beautiful. This is Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, with Whitney Ann Jenkins. Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, where I bring on guests and we talk about the inner authentic voice and the challenges and the rewards that come from following it. And this week, we're going to talk about sex. I have with me Melissa Haidt, and she is a sexual spiritual advisor. She's a great combination of someone who has a wealth of life experience and also the academic credentials to back it up. She's the founder of an education platform called Higher Sex Education, where she does one-on-one coaching with clients. She teaches classes, and she has a monthly support group, which a lot of us could use right now during this COVID time, where a lot of us have been isolated for a long stretch of time. I met Melissa a few years ago in Europe, in Andorra, which, if you don't know, it is this beautiful, tiny country in between France and Spain in the mountains. And I was there visiting my friends, Mary and Tice, who had a contract there with Cirque du Soleil. And Melissa was there helping them out with their son, Jax. And Melissa and I connected there and we kept in touch. And I'm just really impressed by her platform and the message that she is trying to deliver to the world. And so I'm so excited to bring her on and have her share her wisdom with you. And I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. So hi, Melissa. How are you doing? How are you doing today? We'll start there. (laughs) Hi, Whitney. I'm doing really well today. I feel I feel good about life. Today's today feels like an upswing in the roller coaster that is life. That's really good. So just to fill in the listeners about how we know each other, we met a couple of times, probably in Utah, uh, because we have a mutual friend. But I think the very first time that we actually had an exchange of any significance was in Andorra, when you were there nannying Jax for Marion Tice, and I came to visit. And Jax was having a meltdown, an emotional meltdown. And you handled that situation quite beautifully. And it was a moment where I was like, wow, this this lady has really got something. She is pretty unique and special because you were teaching a three-year-old how to handle his emotions through breathing. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed by that because I was thinking about my childhood and how I would have benefited if I learned to breathe that young. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think I remember that moment specifically, but I've had I've had many instances with trying to help Jax breathe because <laughs> he's three. Well, he's four now, but yeah, a lot of that comes from my own empathy and when I'm with other beings and feeling, I'm sure what was happening in that moment was I was aware that he wasn't breathing and that things, energy was really high in his chest and stuck in his throat and he was in a holding pattern. And I think I wanted just to test if I could see if I could get him more into his body and and moving his moving his body, moving his rib cage, like having movement in in the experience that he was having at the moment. I kinda think I was like tapping his belly too. I don't if I'm remembering right, I think I was like yeah, tapping, like, get in it, here. It was like, Wow, why don't we learn this in school? Why isn't this taught mm-hmm. to us? Because it's it's such like a, a tangible way to take care of ourselves I think the the long and short of that that question is that our parents weren't taught and their parents weren't taught and their parents weren't taught and it's we're we're in the time now that we're awakening to a lot of things and hopefully we can start to learn how to care for our younger and of course older generations and teach them more more reliable and healthy skills for life you know better life skills and breathing Gosh, where would we be if we all learned how to breathe first and foremost when anything's happening, when we're sad, when we're anxious, when we're scared, when any number of things come up? What if we 
learned quickly that our go-to is to our breath. Where is your breath right now? Check into your breath. Right. And where that guides us in being able to even understand where emotions are coming from and how to handle Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you said that your parents weren't taught that. And so I want to go back to your childhood and kind of see where you started out and your journey of where you became. So when did you first realize that you had your own individual thoughts and voice inside of you that wasn't being led by someone else? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was quite early. I think I'm pretty lucky for the circumstances, the challenging circumstances that I grew up in. I grew up in in Mormonville, in a very, very uh, dense Mormon population, and I, and I wasn't religious. And everyone was following some other guidance. Everyone was following what they were told in some other way, in a more of a herd mentality more following blindly what they're taught by a religious institution. And it, it always felt off to me. It never felt good to me. And so I just learned really early to follow the beat of my own drum and just do my own thing. I would say I was probably five when I realized like, oh, okay, everyone else is doing that thing and that doesn't feel good. So I'm going to do my own thing, which was challenging and lonely. And I was ostracized a lot and it had its, had its difficulties, but It also taught me how to connect with myself, my own body, my own wants, my own desires, my own guidance, and be okay doing my own thing in the world and not worrying so much about what other people thought about it. Mm -hmm. Were you encouraged by your parents to do that or did they prefer you to try to fit in with the other kids? I would say neither. I would say they were very neutral. They had left religion and they open space for my brother and I to do what we wanted in the world and to decide what we wanted to decide for ourselves. So growing up, the two of us would occasionally go to different churches and try out different things and see what we liked and make our own decisions. But um, I don't think either, I don't think they tried to make me fit in or support me standing out. It was They were just neutral and supportive and whatever I wanted, I guess. Awesome. So when did yeah. you like really learn to breathe? Oh, I, I think I'm still learning. I think I don't, I don't know if I've learned that yet. When did I learn to breathe? Well, I was a gymnast growing up. So I, with athletics, you know, and, and running and stuff like that, I learned breath there. Um, massage therapy school, I learned to slow myself down and be more aware of my breathing in my body. Um Through, all throughout the last 10, 15 years of my life working with sexuality, that's something we didn't talk about yet, but I, yeah. <laughs> I work with, with human sexuality as, as a vocation and, um, you know, good, good lovers are good breathers, really, really. And there's, there's problematic habits that happen with people that don't know how to breathe. And when people don't know how to breathe, problems arise and energy doesn't flow well. And, and sexual, sexuality is all about flow and being present and that's hand in hand with breath. Totally. When did you start to connect those two things with the breath and the sexuality? I don't know. It could be when I was five and when I started to discover sexuality. It could be in my 20s when I was really exploring physically sexually with other people. Um, Again, I still think I'm still working on it. I do Wim Hof stuff now and do breath work with that now. And I still feel like I have such a long way to go Yeah, <laughs> with learning about breathing. I feel like we all do. Yeah. I know that I definitely do. So how did you enter into the field that you currently are from massage therapy to mm-hmm. where you are now leading higher sex education? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've heard this from a lot of people in, in my field that, that this, this job chose them. And we couldn't escape it if we tried. And I definitely resonate with that. I started studying sexuality at a very young age, again, with that Mormon upbringing. Um, I wasn't Mormon, but everyone else around me was. I had a lot of questions. I was really an inquisitive kid. And they weren't answered. (laughs) My questions weren't answered. And further, I would ask a totally normal, acceptable question for a five or six-year-old to ask. And I was met with very uncomfortable, rigid, tense responses. 
And I didn't understand that. Like, that's a normal question to ask about the body. They were almost always about the body for me. Why does my body look like this, work like this? Why does theirs look like that? What is that part on the boys that I don't, like, what is that? And no one would answer these questions. And somewhere in my little brain, I'm so grateful for this, somewhere in my little brain, I knew that my questions weren't wrong, but the people answering them had an issue. And I'm so glad my brain didn't, I'm so glad I didn't internalize that as I was wrong or bad for asking such questions, but I didn't. And so I've studied sexuality my whole life since I was a little, little kid. And I tried to escape the field. <laughs> I tried to not do it consciously. Consciously, I said, God, whoever God is, universe, whatever I'm talking to right now, pick someone else. I don't want to, this is not what I want to do. I don't want to be in Utah helping people with sexuality. That's ridiculous. Like, what a life. No thanks, right? And so I went really hard into performing and acrobatics. And, and that's how we met our mutual friend. That's how I met our mutual friend. And I just very actively pushed this career, this calling, what I know I'm here to do. I pushed it to the side. And that was problematic for me in, in the realm of sexuality. And I understand now that sexual flow will not be stopped. It, it can't be it can't be damned, right? Mm -hmm. It's life force energy. It's, it's, it's part uh, of us. Yes. <laughs> it's who we are. It is life and you can't deny it. And by me denying a huge part of who I am as a sexual being, um, it came at me in really wonky ways. I had more assaults during that time than you would even imagine. I had more dark, shadow sexual energy coming at me that was really traumatic. I had a lot of trauma that came out of that part of my life mm -hmm. um, in the, perf you know, in the performing part, which is crazy, not in any kind of sexual realm, right? In a realm, like as a secretary, I was assaulted more than I uh, was. As yeah, I, I can relate to that. I, yeah. 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 I think, I think it's tricky to understand the power of sexuality too and understand mm -hmm. not just like to overtake someone with our sexuality but to really understand how it can empower us mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so after that I really took it on consciously and said I'm doing this and there's people that aren't gonna not be happy about it particularly family in my life and I gotta do what I gotta do and I gotta support myself and this is what I'm here to do and and I'm doing it anyway people come to me with their their sexual questions, issues, hang-ups, all the time, no matter what I'm doing. And so I might as well cultivate the practice and, and, and hold classes and have clients and make courses and these kind of things. So and it, my life just works better when I do. When I look directly into the wind is how I see it with, with sexual energy. When I just face it head on and I'm just really honest and open and in my integrity with sexuality, things just go a lot better in life. So that's what I'm doing now. Feels good. How, how has that been for you as far as introducing this concept in the society that we're living in today when, when many people are so repressed? Well, I feel like I deeply understand the repression. And so I have a lot of compassion for it. And I have a lot of forgiveness and understanding for it. And I'm holding a different space. I'm holding a space that says, no, these are not shameful topics. No, this is not unnatural. No, this is not bad, wrong, dirty, sinful, period. We all come from sexuality. How on earth could that possibly be wrong? We are made of it. We are in it. It is in everything. It's, it's beautiful. So I just don't hold space. I just don't hear it anymore, almost. You know, I just don't hear that any of this is wrong or bad or, or this conversation is inappropriate in any way. I just don't have room for that or time for that. It's not interesting. It's an old story that's dying. Yes. Can you talk about you know the work that you've done in Utah specifically with mm -hmm. the people there? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I I continue to have ongoing one on one clients and my my number one clientele is what I refer to as religious recovery. Is people coming out of religion that 
know that they don't know things and they're ready to like go back and pick up the missing pieces, the developmental pieces that they should have learned at, at three about breathing, you know, about at five about boundaries and, and autonomy with your body. There's all these things that we all needed to have learned growing up to develop into these healthy sexual beings and we missed them and that's okay. You know, we don't need to blame anyone. We don't need to get mad about it, but it is our responsibility to go heal from it. So um, that's my number one one-on-one -on -one clientele, mostly is, is that religious recovery. I spent um, two and a half years hosting a weekly, a weekly sex ed meetup called The Birds and the Bees. Mm -hmm. And that was extremely challenging and really fun. Every week I taught a class on... Again, two years of it, two and a half years of it, it was on all sorts of things. It was on self-love and boundaries and um, different relationship dynamics and anatomy and physiology and pleasure. Pleasure is a very important piece of sex education that we kind of tense up around and get scared at. And pleasure is uh, a necessary part of sex education, a holistic view of sex education if we want it to be sex positive we have to include pleasure conversations. So years of, of that was fantastic. And that must have been pretty rewarding. Yeah. And so challenging, just ridiculously challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about maybe a little bit more about like sexuality as part of ourselves holistically and how it contributes to our voice, mm -hmm. like the, the power that is within that? There's definitely a huge correlation with, with our sexuality and our voice. And most of the time, there's definitely a huge disconnection with our sexuality and our voice. And it's almost physiological. It's almost like we can't speak about it and when we're stuck and we're caught in our throats. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were asking, but there's definitely that, that correlation with our voice and sexuality. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You, yeah. You can speak on that. Yeah. There's so much, um, especially with women. We're all taught to, to be silent about these things anyway, and we're all caught in our voice anyway. Um, but especially women, we're not taught to access. Well, it goes back to religion. We're not taught to, taught to access our own inner wisdom. We're taught that wisdom is somewhere outside of us. That, uh, the knowing, the all-knowing, this like greater voice is outside of us and someone else will give you that information. It's not for you to have. Mm -hmm. When I think, I think the truth is that our inner wisdom and our inner voice is inside our bodies. And we find that through embodiment. We find that through connecting with ourselves in the present moment in our bodies. So when we get that connection, that's the first step, connecting with the body. And then after that, we can start to learn how to speak what comes from that. But we're, we can't speak to our truth and our inner knowing if we don't know how to connect with our truth and our inner knowing. So we have to learn how to connect with that. And then the rest will flow. And I see sexual as, as being innervated with all things. Okay, yeah. Like the divine, the divine feminine, the divine masculine, maybe that kind of? Everything. Yeah. Everything. Sexuality is in everything that's ever been created because it's creation energy. It comes from creation. Every song is sexual, right? Every art piece, every building. And then, of course, all of nature is creation. Every tree, every flower, every bee, every bird, all of it. It all comes from this life force, this creation energy. And when we try to stifle that within our own bodies, when we deny that power, when we deny that divine intelligence that's within our own bodies, it comes out wonky. It comes out distorted. I call it like a sexual distortion mm -hmm. when we try to suppress such things. Um, and when people are... When people are connected with their, their life force, their sexuality, their creativity, their voice, their intuition, this whole channel that lines up with, within us, we feel that within other people. You know when you come across someone that's connected there. You feel that power. It's palpable. 
And when, when someone's not connected there, when they're shut off, when they're stifled, when they're trying to deny it, you kind of feel this like, um, something's uncomfortable there. Something's a little bit off there. Yes. Maybe you can't quite put your fingers on it, but you know, you know, when someone's in touch with that, you know, when someone's aligned with their sexual energy and their power. So what advice would you give someone who is having trouble connecting with that power, that voice within themselves mm. to, in order to in, be able to embody their whole self? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't think there's any one size fits all answer because um, it, it, it somewhat depends on how you got there. It somewhat depends on what's stuck, what story's in the way, what belief system is in the way. Um, but it's always in the body. It always comes back to the body. It always comes back to being embodied. All my work is body centered. And I bring, I bring people back to what's happening right now inside your body. What are you feeling here? And there's always something, there's always like a tension in the gut or like a sickness or a numbness somewhere, or I don't feel anything like, or a rising above the body completely. I don't feel anything. I don't know what you're talking about feelings. Um, so the answer for everybody is in the body, but there's different routes to getting there. There's different tools needed for each individual and each individual knows how to get there. Every single one of us knows what to do and we just need to connect with that and ask our bodies and have a conversation. Yeah. To be brave enough to be with ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And also to be able to define our boundaries, which is a huge thing that I'm still learning. Uh -huh. That's my biggest soapbox. I have so much to say about boundaries. Go I've worked for it. With it. Yeah, I could go for hours. I've worked with it so much. And that's, I think that's what I've learned the most in, in my work with sexuality. Um, boundaries are, boundaries are always momentary. And this is a, a part that people don't understand that your boundaries change in every given moment and the, the information necessary to access your boundaries comes from the body, comes from feelings, and it comes in the moment, in this moment. It doesn't come in another moment. If it's coming in another moment, then your head is creating that boundary. Your mind is, which is, it can definitely be useful. You can definitely set yourself, your mind, set yourself up for a boundary in the future of make sure you don't do A, B, and C because whatever reason. So that's a possibility, but your boundary is your personal truth and your personal truth changes in every moment. So a boundary could be something as simple as I like the color yellow. And that doesn't sound like a boundary, but it's something that defines me in this moment. Mm -hmm. In the next moment, maybe I don't like the color yellow. Um, the basic boundary work, the, at the very, very base boundary work that I do with people is asking you right now, Whitney, are you thirsty? Would you like a drink of water? What does yeah. your body say? Yes, I would actually. Yeah. yeah. And starting that simple and sticking with that every day. So that's step one. Would you like a glass of water? And you said yes. Your body said yes. How did you? How did you know? Hmm. Uh, cues from my body. Um, my my tongue is like ah, I need some water. So I'm gonna go back, but real quick. Step two <laughs> is to honor that. So if you'd like to take a, a drink of water right now, I would. It's okay. I would. I would suggest you do so because what that does is build self trust. This builds trust with your body. Mm -hmm. Knowing what your boundary is. Number two. Number one, knowing your boundary. Number two, honoring your boundary. The more we do this, we, the more we build self-trust. Trust is about understanding and knowing something. Trust doesn't just come. Trust doesn't just happen. And when we know and understand and trust ourselves and our bodies and our inner voices, that, that builds a bond with the self. That builds a relationship with the self that is strong, that is solid, that is beautiful, that is sustainable, Right. Right. This. So, so really we have to be able to trust ourselves before we're able to even begin to 
put trust in someone else. Absolutely. Because if we don't trust ourselves first and only put trust in someone else and putting that in quotes, if we only put trust in someone else, if that ever wavers, we lose ourselves completely. In fact, we've already lost ourselves if we put it into someone else and we don't have that solid practice with ourselves of knowing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this definitely speaks to like our inner authentic voice too, and being able to connect with that and staying true with that at all times. Totally. Yeah. It's absolutely necessary for a healthy life. Really is connecting with that inner voice, knowing that inner voice, trusting it, listening to it first. Right. Some people don't realize that they have one. They don't realize that they have an, uh, an inner voice. So how would you, through your, your healing and your teaching that you do, how would you help them access that? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Cause it, I do forget such things. And of course that's a possibility that someone will listen to this and be like, what on earth are those crazy ladies talking about? Right. And this is just natural for me and every day for me. So I really appreciate you bringing that in that we're all at different levels of awareness. Right. And we're all on different paths. Right. And yes, you're right. Some people are not even aware that they have an inner voice. Um, With them, I start with that basic that basic question of, are you thirsty and getting signals? Most people don't know whether they want a drink of water or not, let alone, do I want to have sex with this person or not? Mm. We got to know the, right? Isn't that scary? That's a lot. Yeah. 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 Most of us don't have access to that answer of, would I like a drink of water or not? So I start with that foundational stuff, foundational kind of questions like that, that are really basic, really simple. um, Because, it's how we practice the little things b- build practicing these little things asking yourself all the time do i want a glass of water and listen to your body your body will give you yeses or nos the yeses are often expansive and enlivening and i feel everyone has their own feelings so i'm just telling you what my body communicates to me my yeses feel um broadening, expansive, almost like effervescent, like a bubbling through my chest and my face. This is what a yes is for my body often. And no for me feels restrictive. It feels like a stop, a hard stop. My throat will stop. My chest will harden. Something in my body has a a clear um, stopping point. It's very rigid and contracting. It gets like into a very tight contraction, something somewhere in my body. We'll get into a tight contraction. And again, the yes is this openness. So I ask myself, I do this when I'm going for a walk. Do you want to turn right? I'll just like look to the right and feel my feelings. And mm-hmm. then I'll look to the left and feel my feelings. And I'll know which way to go from doing that. So I practice in all of these basic moments and just allow it to happen and allow myself to build this conversation with my body. Yeah, allowing yourself to make decisions rather than having someone else make them for you. Right. Yeah. Which is quite literally acknowledging your own power, right? Right. And so because so, there are so many people that don't realize that they have this power, what do you think, since you've been studying this and working with this for so long, what do you think are the contributing factors of that with of the human, disconnection? Yeah, of the disconnection. Just in our society, in this country, mm-hmm. you've traveled a lot, so you can probably speak to other countries and how yeah. we are in comparison. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think huge factors in the disconnection are um, the fast-paced life, the busy, 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 go, 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 do, do, do. Um, because what that is doing is putting something else ahead of our body's needs, putting goals, money, productivity, status quo, social status in front of our our personal truth. One of the things I love about Europe is there's so much more honoring of the personal truth Mm -hmm. than in the United States. It's it's way more commonplace to have a business just closed down because they have something else to do or because they're tired or because they don't feel good. You don't see that in America. In America, it's like, damn it, you get to work. I don't care how you feel. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible and repulsive to me. The busy, busy, busy is so incredibly repulsive to me. I'm not, I'm not impressed when someone is so busy that they can't be present. 
right. and aware. And, you know, it's the difference between being reactive and responsible, having a nervous system that is reactive rather than, and by responsible, I mean having the ability to respond. When you're present, when you're slowed down enough, when you're here and something comes to you, something comes in front of you, a question, an opportunity, whatever it may be, having the ability to respond, to check into your body, to know what feels best, to know your truth and to act upon that rather than being reactive is night and day, it is night and day with how you live your life. Right, so reacting not from fear basically is another way of saying that. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, of how many people make decisions based on fear right now mm -hmm. um, with everything going on. During these crazy COVID times, there are a lot of people who are isolated and probably feeling very lonely and not being able to explore their sexuality in ways that they would want to. What, what advice do you have for that? I am very much appreciating the challenges right now. I'm definitely challenged and I know most people are definitely challenged with what's what we're facing, what's in front of us. And I really appreciate so many people being forced isn't the word I like, but being pushed to connect with themselves and to be with themselves. We've been running from ourselves for so long. And I love it that it's like, you no, know, sit down and you get to be with you. You get to be with your feelings. Yeah, I'm definitely not connecting with other people sexually in the ways that I would like to, but there's no way to not, like we're always connecting with sexualities, whether we're conscious of it or not. Right. We're not limited by our circumstances at all. That's an illusion that we're limited by our circumstances. We can absolutely explore our sexuality inside of our body, outside of our body, sensation, play, pleasure, just like it's endless. It's literally endless the exploration and the creativity and the play that can happen with me, myself, and I. We have yeah. definitely not found the depths of that exploration yeah, as a I, society. I don't think so. I don't think we're even able to speak openly about doing so. Yeah. And so with your work, what is your hope for where, you know, higher sex education can take us? Mm. Into I love that question. Sure, yeah. I've little tangent here. I've definitely been referred to with a wide range of compliments and criticisms of being a total sinner, total slut, all of these things, like a complete whore from that end of the spectrum to just a complete saint. And I think I think both are very true. My work is to to help usher in a world that is more conscious and vibrant and just natural with sexuality. That it just, it just is. It's not overexpressed. It's not underexpressed, but a more balanced world. And the altruistic part of me is like to, to get everyone on this level of, not everyone, but enough people on this level of consciousness where sexuality can be healthy and we can take it out of the gutter. We can take it out of being this um, hedonistic, dark, shadowy thing and bring it into the light that it deserves. I want a balance for all of us, including myself. I want a healthy balance. What are some ways that people can help you on your mission? Mm. How can we support you in doing that? Oh, so many ways. I think I think the first thing we can all do is connect with ourselves and our own inner wisdom, the whole conversation that we're having today, and start to notice our own attitudes around sexuality. So when you think about it, when you see something that you think is sexual, when you have a feeling, when there's a, a joke or a phrase or whatever, notice what you notice in your body. And like, really, that's just step one. I just want everyone to start being aware and notice like, oh, did you, did you cringe when you heard the word penis? What's that about? And just be with it and just like be with your body and like, huh, what's happening there? That's step one, really. Just noticing your, your body's reaction as you go about in the world. 
I think that's how you all can help me. <laughs> Other ways you could, you know, um, eventually purchase my book, which is not written yet. And, <laughs> and my courses, which are not available yet. And um, yeah, one-on-one -on -one coaching is absolutely available. Sure. So if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, that's another way. Yeah, I think that speaks to getting to know ourselves and, and taking care of ourselves first and the ripple effect of that into the world, a collective effect. Yes. I was just looking for an antonym for self-love. I was just looking for another term for self-love mm -hmm. because it's kind of a buzzword that yeah. is not really respected and it's, it's whatever. It's, it's kind it's of lost gained, its, its connotation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so go to thesaurus.com and type in self-love and it's horrible. <laughs> not a single response is wow. positive. All mm -hmm. of it is about selfishness and um, pride and like all it's just, it's shocking that there's not another term for how do we attend to and regard our own needs and our own desires and our own feelings. What we don't even have, we literally don't have language for it. That breaks my heart. Oh, we need to create a new word, I think. I'm, I'm working on it. Let me know if you find anything because I don't know. If anyone don't has know what it is any yet. ideas for words, send them in. <laughs> right. But that's what it is. It's self-love. That's what it is, is we're, we're love is a verb. Right. Love mm -hmm. as a verb. If I didn't say that clearly enough, what do we do to attend to, to love, to cultivate our relationship with ourself? Mm, that's good. It's everything. Yes, I, I believe so. Oh, breathe. <sighs> I just get going on rants. Thanks for getting me on rants. Yep, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> did I answer your question? Sometimes I just go. And totally. I don't remember. You totally did. Okay. Definitely. All right. I'm just going to take a breath. Do you want to take a breath mm -hmm. in the middle yeah. of this? <sighs> How are you feeling? <laughs> Good. I was just looking at notes that I wrote earlier, which is kind of like doing a stream of consciousness, mm -hmm. writing about authenticity and our inner voice. I call it the still small voice. I for sure didn't come up with that myself. I'm not sure who did. A lot of people refer to it as the still small voice. And I love that. Um, yeah. Anger and hate is often loud. Mm. Oh yeah. And what do we, what do we learn when we, what can we find? when we learn to listen to the quieter spaces and the whispers. For me, I find everything there. All of my best guidance, all of my best decisions, yeah. all of my greatest joys have come from that, those little whispers. Totally, and when you are constantly inundated with information all the time and media and news, it's really difficult to even quiet down. I took a 24-hour electronic detox a little bit into the pandemic because I it was just too much for me to handle. I was like, I need a break from everything. So I turned off everything, my phone, my computer, all electronic devices. And I was just going to, you know, sit in the backyard and enjoy the trees. And I just had all of this information coming to me without being attached to any sort of device. It was just something that I have access to all the time. It was way more powerful than anything, you know, that I could. It's just right. that connection is way more powerful than any, you know, of the latest AI technology that we have or are developing. So our inner wisdom, I feel like, is pretty powerful and overlooked entirely and not even recognized yeah it's entirely powerful and most often overlooked it's definitely not respected in in our culture as being a powerful force and again most don't even aren't even aware aren't even aware that there's that inner guidance system and that's okay too like hey mm -hmm. if you want to operate we can we're here to do whatever we want right like right. if you want to operate with just using technology and if that's your jam I'm not here to tell you True. not to, but if you're interested in the still small voice, just try. <laughs> I'm down. Let's yeah. do that because that's, I'm, that's my jam. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about people who want to not talk all day and sit with the trees. Yes. That's a way, uh, that's a way that what our mutual friends describes you and Mary, that you guys could just go all day with not having any kind of conversation. Yeah, it's true. It's a very 
interesting, unique friendship because we're both pretty introverted when it comes down to it. And so we can just sit in a room beside each other and, and not say anything for a long period of time and just be okay with it. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Yeah, that, that inner guidance system. I think it's beautiful. I think it's great. I, I have recently decided that I'm going to be keeping electronics in a separate room at the front of my, my space. And the back of my space is for a different vibration. Well, you, you know what's also interesting is I've been home with my parents for a little while, taking a break from the craziness of LA. And I'm noticing that they have the TV on and then they have their iPad and their phone while they're on the TV. And I'm like, okay, so this generation, like I'm a millennial, like this generation that my parents are, are more addicted to their devices than I am. And that's scary. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I, I'm addicted. I'm working a job now where I have to stare at a screen all day. And I thought I would die before I would ever do such a thing. And at this point in our, in our society, I'm really grateful for this job. Um, but then I have work that I want to do with clients, you know, in the Zoom calls and with all sorts of things and marketing and different stuff on the computer. And I went from like zero to 90 with my electronic usage. And I definitely notice my connection with spirit is definitely wavered mm -hmm. and I've lost it. And it takes cultivation, just like any relationship, it takes cultivating. It takes a level of constancy where you're checking in and they are different vibrations than these electronic means, than the media means. Um, we have to learn how to have discipline. We have to have our own masculine sides, have the discipline to shut down to yeah. create the boundaries of these need to be turned off at this time. They need uh -huh. to go over here. We need this long of a fast. And it's, and it's not even, so like a lot of people meditate on their devices now. They use like Headspace or Calm or, or all those meditation apps. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people think, okay, I'll meditate for these like five to 20 minutes every morning and I'm good for the day and they'll just forget about it. But I think it's important to keep in mind every moment to tune in. Like you have to constantly check in with yourself to tune in. And that comes from practice. That's, yeah. you know, you got to train yourself. Totally. But it's worth it. Yeah. That training is worth it. That makes you a ninja. <laughs> that gives you superpowers. Yeah, I'm learning that. I'm, le I'm learning. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm laughing and not joking. <laughs> no, it does give you, it gives you, it gives you a solid grounded center that no matter what comes your way, like you're able to go back to that. Mm -hmm. And cultivating that level of presence gives you more, you're able to perceive more information in, in any and every given moment. You're able to be more aware of what's going on around you, how you react to it, how other people are reacting to it. And that gives you more choice. If you're aware like, oh, I'm freaking out because... A, B, and C, or whatever. That gives you choice. Now that I'm aware that I'm freaking out in this social setting, say, then I can choose to change my breath and calm myself down or go outside for a minute and walk around or to ignore it completely and get more anxious and stick my foot in my mouth and like mess it up with <laughs> that business deal or that whatever, potential dating partner, whatever it may be. Right, yeah. Because I can definitely recognize when I'm tuned in and when I'm tuned out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, I had a big coming home last night. I was completely tuned out for my work day yesterday and just stressed and just wasn't present. Um, there's only so much we can take. Our nervous systems can only handle so much before we disassociate, before we leave. So much stimulation, so much pain, so much frustration, these kind of things. We can only tolerate so much before we just go somewhere else. And this is a big core of addiction issues, right? But when I came back to myself last night, I was like, oh gosh, where have I been? And I realized I, realized I had been elsewhere all day. That's really rare for me. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a normal thing for me. Um, I've been practicing this presence game actively, passionately, consciously for many years. And, uh, you know, not to, not to like toot my own horn and say that I'm there in any way but it's a it's a consistent practice of mine but the coming home last night I was just elated I was elated to be in my body again 
I was elated to just be experiencing life again. You know, my circumstances didn't change, but it felt so good just to be with me and alive because I've cultivated that relationship with me. I love me. I love being with me. Right. I'm awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm excited I get to hang out with me, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you can get to that point, I think you're golden. Yeah. But it's not, it's not a final destination, though. No. Like I spent the whole day gone, right? I spent the whole day stressed, frustrated, angry, bitchy, out of body. Right. It's like a, it's a moment to moment thing, just like we were talking about boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. We've touched on a lot of golden things. We have. I want people to understand that when transitioning into this kind of a life of being more present and aware with the body and of, of your emotions, it sounds really beautiful and glorified and ethereal and light. And we, what we don't talk about enough is how difficult and arduous that is and how when you get in touch with your body, you're getting in touch with all the things you've ignored that are happening yeah. in your body. Mm -hmm. And there's some floodgates that open. And I want everyone to know that about these challenges and to get support oh, thank you and to have a lot of forgiveness with yourself, get yeah. a therapist, have something, someone that you can talk to so you don't revert back to, um, back to closing yourself down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It gets uncomfortable for a little while. And on the other, on the other side of that, uh, there's a space to breathe and, and some peace I've experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to go through that. If but you it, get stuck yeah. in that, mm -hmm. you're stuck. But you got to go all the way through that tunnel. Yeah, you have to like look the fear in the eyes. When you're just starting out, you probably don't know how to go all the way through that tunnel. Right. Mm -hmm. And that probably doesn't make any sense. And screw you, this feels terrible. Who is this lady who thinks she knows what she's talking about? Right. Um, so I I want to I want to bring presence to the fact that this isn't all love and light when we're connecting with our body, when we're listening to our own inner wisdom, what comes up in these spaces, like I said, in the beginning is all this old stuff that you've ignored for a while. But as you continue, you'll continue to have uncomfortable feelings. And those uncomfortable feelings are, you know, I actually don't want this person in my life anymore. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I actually can't keep this job. Or I do have to speak up about how they're treating me because it's not appropriate or these kind of things like uncomfortable things will come up difficult, challenging, mm -hmm. horrible things come up because, Hey, that's life. And this is what, yeah, this is what we're doing. And I think it is possible to get to a point where you start to look forward to the challenges because you know that on the other side, there's a lot of growth that happens with that. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. almost like a comfortability in the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yep. It can become more familiar. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I wouldn't say that I, I have a, a comfortability in the com uncomfortable. I wouldn't say that I'm comfortable at all. I definitely still have my own resistance and my own fight, but I, I have learned how to let that go for myself so I can get through the process. But I'm never like, yay, for this horrible life change. <laughs> I'm yeah. so glad I was rejected today. Woo. True. Like, but I, I try. <laughs> right. I try to find the good in that. I try to, to find the, the, the gems, the juice in all of those experiences because I know better. Mm -hmm. But I'm not happy about it in the moment. <laughs> no, no. If you, if you don't go through the unhappiness in the moment, <laughs> then that, that, that's bad news too. So. Yeah. Yeah, because then it's then then where is it going? Right. Then what happens? Because it goes somewhere. <laughs> it does go somewhere. It goes to the body, mm -hmm. and it gets stored, and it becomes stagnant energy, and it it grows and festers in a particular way. I've always had this type of sixth, sixth sense where I have I have visuals of things like, like that. I have this very interesting visual awareness, and I discovered it mostly. I cultivate it more in massage school. Um, that I could touch people's bodies and I, I wasn't just feeling things. I could see things. 
Mm -hmm. I could see colors and patterns that gave me really clear information. I can read those colors and patterns and get information from that. And what happens is we get stuck in stagnant energy if we don't address our feelings, our issues, our problematic thought behaviors and patterns. Right. Mm -hmm. That gets stored somewhere somehow and creates disease. Yeah. And in this like busy, busy lifestyle that we've created for ourselves, I've, I know that I've experienced, oh, I'm, I'm too busy. Like I can't deal with this right now. I'll, I'll deal with it later. And I push it to the side and it manifests into something else. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a necessary and really quite a cool adaptation that we have as humans to be able to do such a thing. Mm -hmm. Like that's too stressful right now and we'll compartmentalize it and push it to the side. The problem becomes when we don't go back to it. Right. We have to consciously, as quick as you can, as soon as you can, go back to it. I've learned that with some traumas. I've had some traumas in my life. And the ones that I've moved through the smoothest are the ones that I addressed the feelings as soon as I could, as directly, as fiercely as I could. My last partner, um, my last boyfriend killed himself after him and I got in a fight. Mm. And um, I don't know if you knew that. Did you know that? I, I knew bits and pieces of it. Yeah, please. Yeah. Go. We got in an argument and then, and then he took his own life. And um, I was so blessed to have a couple people, two women specifically, that came to me very quickly. And we processed a lot of things. And the biggest part was we went to this yoga studio and we screamed and we cried and we moved and we laughed and we, I probably vomited. Like I did all of it in my body. I didn't, I, I didn't think twice about exercising all of those feelings out of my body. And it really made me understand the grieving process and how necessary that is for the grieving process to move the energy through our bodies. Cause then of course, going to the funeral later, with rooms full of people that have not screamed and wailed and beaten things and done all that I did and tried to intellectualize, mm -hmm. intellectualizing grief, it's, it's vastly inefficient to yeah. say the least. It's yeah. vastly inefficient. And um, I don't, <laughs> I got lost now in this intensity. I don't remember how I got on this, but I think the point was to, oh, to address, that's what it was, was to address these things quickly. I think if I would have done that a week later, it would have been a completely different process and I would still be working through more stuckness in myself. But because I did that so quickly, I think it was about 24 hours later yeah. that I was emoting in such a way was instrumental to my healing process. I think, I, I think that goes to show just how much uh, work that you've done to get to the point to be able to do that. Yeah. I had to. I wouldn't have been okay if I didn't do that. And not to say that that was the end of my grieving. God, I'm not done. Yeah. You know, that's going to be a process for a long time for me. But that got me out of the thick of it so I didn't get buried in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super, super important information. Yeah. Right yeah. Thank you for sharing so that. So the, the compartmentalizing was necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. Putting things to the side was necessary. So, you know, I'm not in a coffee shop or whatever and screaming and wailing, like putting things to the side is a, is a good adaptation for humans. And we must go back to readdress those traumas, to readdress the, not even the traumas, to readdress the energy mm -hmm. that we didn't address in the moment. And to be able to fully breathe, I feel like. Yeah. And and you know what's required to readdress these things? Time and space. Which this crazy COVID time is providing us. So yeah. it's been a big gift in a lot of ways. Yeah, but if you live your life on a, a busy, busy, full schedule, you're never going to have time to go back and look at and reflect upon things you need to reflect upon. <sighs> yeah. It's, it's necessary. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what if we scheduled that into our days and our weeks? Mm -hmm. Process time, reflection time. Oh, that would be amazing. I'm going to start we, doing that. We need to come up with a term for that and market it right away. 
<laughs> right away. <laughs> Make a business out of it. Profit off this immediately. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like just reflection time. And I see myself having, because I love lists, I see myself having a list of things that I need to reflect upon. Okay, like conversation amazing. you had with mother, you know, injustice you had with that business Melissa, transaction. You're not a Virgo, are you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I love lists. Do you love lists? Lists are pretty good. I like them. They're pretty great. Let's have a whole podcast on lists. <laughs> How great lists are and organizing i would like that i would like that. <laughs> except i'm we'll, we'll talk about that another time <laughs> totally but how great is that idea of having setting the boundary setting the container for reflective time i think that's genius i think yes i don't know why that's not a thing it is now and so it is <sighs> good stuff good stuff here guys that's really not hard. Like, no, it's not. Today hard. from 7 to 8 p.m., I'm having reflective time, and I'm going to sit down and look at the things that I've avoided looking at. Wow, that's, that's big. And see what comes out of that. I'm such a geek. That sounds so exciting for me. Is that just me? No, it's, it's, it uh, has kind of what I was saying earlier about like being excited for the challenges that mm -hmm. come up. Because it's a way to learn new things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The growth mindset. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrap up the conversation with this question. If your inner voice had a billboard, what would it say to the world? Mm. Two things came to mind. They're both welcome. You know, I think the number one thing is these four words. There is no other. There is no other. So if you're neglecting your relationship with yourself, if you're ignoring yourself, if you're telling yourself to shut up because you're busy or stop, you know, telling your body to stop hurting because you don't have time to deal with that or whatever it may be, that's how you treat your loved ones. That's how you, that's, that reflects in your world. There is no other. We don't, we don't get to, neglect ourselves and have thriving relationships. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite mantras. And of, of course it goes all ways. Of course it's, right. it's you don't treat other people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. Of course it's a multidimensional statement. Exactly. I like that one. Yeah. I'm going to write it down. There is no other. The second thing that came to my mind was let it all happen. Mm -hmm. That's a mantra of mine of just mm -hmm. allowing Allowing that surrender, that flow of just letting it, just letting it happen. There's a divine intelligence. It, it's, it's more savvy at getting your greatest desires met than you are. Right. And surrendering to that intelligence is, it's not a, an easy thing. It's not easy, but it's very rewarding when you do. It's not easy because we're trained for another way, but it's entirely easy because that's all it is, is ease. All you do is, is lay back in the water. It's too, yes. It's entirely easy. Yes, it is. And it's, it's, it's easy for it to be easy once you allow it to be easy. <laughs> exactly. And it's okay if it's not easy for you sometimes. It is okay. Yeah. Because we're fighting, we're fighting the training and the, the programming. We're dismantling a certain programming right now. Yes. So it's okay if there's a struggle there sometimes, for sure. Right. It's all, it's all like a, a paradox, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> unless you know, unless you know, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you know, then you don't know. <laughs> And forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know when you didn't know it. It's okay. Mm. I love the conversations of self-compassion. And yeah. there's such a sweetness to it that I feel in my heart. And just want, want everyone to feel that too. It's this like big lover of mine. Can't we all just feel this love? Right now I'm feeling it. <laughs> I, I feel it too. 
I feel yeah. it. I, I have hope for the rest. And I think that we can only be a, a shining, guiding light as we feel it ourselves. Today is the day, Whitney. It's not a someday. Today, <laughs> we are beaming love out of our hearts like Care Bears. <sighs> I love Care Bears. <laughs> I do too. No wonder I felt connected to them. Such a great visual. All right. So if people would like to find you in the world of the internet. I was going to say the virtual world. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> how, how would they stumble upon you? Thank you. You may find me in the virtual world. If you're finding me in another world right now, that's scary because I am hidden at the moment. <laughs> the virtual world. Um, HigherSexEducation.com. H-I-G-H-E-R, higher, like a higher vibration, HigherSexEducation.com. I also have an Instagram at Higher Sex Education, and then there's a Facebook group, same name. Any of those will get you to me. You can see the different offerings that I have at the moment, mostly one-on-one um, -on -one coaching and group coaching because all of my events at the moment are not happening. I have a, yeah. a plethora of, of, of live events that... Yes. aren't happening. And you have a, a monthly support group that I have joined a couple times and I highly yes. recommend. Thank you. Group support. Yeah. Group learning is a whole different kind of learning and I love it. That's yeah. a fun group. First Wednesday of every month I do that. Information can be found on my website. You can contact me via the website. The website. There's good blog posts and different things on there, good resources on there, and it's continuing to grow. So check in. It will grow. Thank I, you. I have a good feeling about it. It's yeah. happening. Yep, it is. Thank you so much for joining me on this conversation. I feel like it was, Thank you. It was really fun and, and, yeah. and good. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Yes. Thank you so much. This was beautiful. I really yes. appreciated this talk. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you next time. And until then, stay tuned in to you.